This morning we'll be in Matthew chapter 2, looking at verses 3 through 8, 3 through 8, and then we'll follow with communion. Worship is an act of the heart, and, and that would be true if I make that statement, but it's an act of the heart that focuses, right? It really is an act of the heart that focuses on God. I don't know how many times that I will be sitting back there waiting to get up here and teach when I should be worshiping the Lord. I'm thinking of the message. I'm trying to, to, to you know, get it in my mind, the, the, the theme, the, the topic, and make sure I'm touching what I want to touch on, what the Lord has led me to, to teach on, and, and these thoughts. And then I realize, oh, I'm supposed to be lifting my arms lifted high and worship the Lord. You know, see, so focus on God is true worship. When, when we really give him our arms, when we really give him our hearts, Matthew tells us, and we'll see it later on, maybe next year is the, at the rate we're going, Matthew chapter 8, he talks about a leopard who came and he worshiped Jesus. And he said to him, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. We, we learn three things from this leopard uh, when we compare the different gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mark mentions that he came beseeching. Uh, the word beseeching means that he was in a sense begging uh, in uh, hoping, desiring uh, to get his attention. And Lord, if you can, I know that uh, you can make me well. Matthew tells us that he bowed down. It wasn't a, a matter of just bowing down in a religious sense, but he literally bowed himself in humility before the Lord to worship him. Mark tells us that he fell on his knees before him, prostrating himself in worship in, in, in total surrender to him total surrender to him saying basically look i have a need and if you are willing because i know you can do it so that's not even the question you have the power and the authority but if you're willing you know i come and i humble myself before you i i I let go of everything that i think i know everything that i think i have control of and i give it all to you luke says that he fell on his face see that's a heart of honor and worship before the lord Unlike Herod, the Magi's had come to worship Jesus. These were Gentiles who had knew that this shining star was a prophecy being fulfilled that the Messiah would come. And so they brought gifts. They brought themselves to come and worship the Lord. Unlike Herod, who was more concerned for himself. And so in verses 3 through 8, we find Herod a false worshiper. He was troubled. This morning's theme is troubled Herod. Trouble Herod. And there are a lot of people that are troubled over Jesus. A lot of people who love Jesus and care about Jesus and know Jesus intimately and deeply. And I love those people. But there are people that are troubled about Jesus. They don't like him. They run when they hear his name. They don't, they don't want to hear about him. In fact, they'll, they'll just basically say, talk to the hand, I'm walking away. You know, I don't want to get into religious, you know, rhetoric in a sense. A lot of troubled people. Let's go ahead and read and we'll start back at verse one so we get the full context here to verse eight. It says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests, the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him in Bethlehem, Judea, for thus It is written by the prophets, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the least among the rulers of Judea, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search out carefully for this young child. And when you found him, bring bring word to me that I may come and worship him also. Herod is disturbed at the birth of Christ. We see in verse 3 that Herod, who is the king, heard about this and that he was troubled. 
disturbed would be a, another translation, or alarmed. And not only was he alarmed, but all of Jerusalem was alarmed. Uh, speaks of his power, his authority. Uh, he has some status there. If Herod's alarmed, we're alarmed. We don't want Herod to be upset, because if Herod's upset, then we're also in trouble. We might have the trickling down effect, you know, and it might come to us. Herod's throne was in jeopardy, and so he was troubled. Herod had one terrible flaw in his character. He was almost insanely suspicious. He was an individual that was suspicious about everything. Um, No matter what was going on around him, there's a motive. Something's going on. And that was Herod. He'd always been suspicious. And the older he became, the more suspicious he grew until in his old age he was, as someone said, a murderous old man. If he's suspicious, everyone as a re- was a revival to him or revival to him in power and person, he would then eliminate. When Herod was troubled, everyone was troubled, most likely because of his rage, which Herod was known for. He would become very angry and he would lash out. We've all heard the phrase, wait till your father gets home. I don't know how many times I've heard that phrase when I was little. My mother would say, wait till your father gets home. I knew exactly what that meant. That meant I was in big trouble. Uh, I didn't really worry at that moment, but I worried as the hours drew closer to him coming home. And then if it was evening, I knew I was safe until the morning when my father would wake up and then my mother would either uh, uh, reemphasize what she said the night before or, or encourage him to do something about what I had failed to do or lack of doing. And then I would you know, get the, the belt to the seat of understanding so that I wouldn't uh, do it again. But a very familiar phase. We all know that. The word troubled here is the same word used of the word aggregation in the pool of Bethsaida there. You remember the people were waiting around that pool and they were waiting for apparently their suspicion was or superstition was that that an angel came and, and aggravated the water and they knew that the angel was there so they'd jump in in hopes that they would get healed of whatever infirmities they had. And so they'd wait and wait and wait until the water was aggregated. It moved. The word is also used of Jesus when he was in the garden when he said, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. So there's Jesus praying in the garden, and he knows that he needs to go to the cross. He's going to be handed over to the leaders of Israel. He'll be abused and mocked and ridiculed and beaten and just ripped up to shreds. And he prayed, Lord, my soul is really... Yeah, anyone would be troubled knowing that. Jesus was so troubled that Luke tells us that he began to sweat uh, drops of blood from from his foreheads and and the side of his temple and his face. Uh, Doctors have suggested that there are blood vessels leading out in in various areas and that the stress was so great that the blood vessels blew and then the blood would begin to pour forth. So that's pretty troubled when you think about it. Same word with Herod. You can almost... Picture Herod's face turning red with anger and frustration. Uh, Maybe he was a good politician and it didn't turn red and he was able to keep it all internal, but he was boiling inside over this whole situation. Uh, Isn't it interesting how people do not like to hear about Jesus? They just can't take it. They get so upset. I have so many relatives who will just walk into a conversation when I'm sharing or talking about the Lord because I just love doing it. And they'll turn right around and you'll see them. They'll turn right around and just walk out because they don't want to talk about the Lord. They don't want to talk about Jesus. Well, that's all I have to talk about. I love talking about him and I look for every opportunity to share Jesus. And that's not going to change in my life because that's my purpose in life is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't have a lot of great relationships. I've made a lot of enemies because I am very upfront with my faith in Jesus and I love talking about him a lot more. And so I'm, as I get older, I get more comfortable with that. 
because I don't care anymore in a sense. Now, I'm not saying that in a sense that I don't care about the person. I don't care about the, the attitude that they have towards me. I'd rather, you know, you want to go, you go. I'm going to continue to share. But they feel that Jesus is depriving them of some pleasure or calling them to make un, some unwilling sacrifice. You know, you thought that. I thought that in the beginning. I thought he's going he's gonna to tell me to, to not do this anymore. And, oh, I love doing that. But God is so gentle when he does do that. He's going to ask me to sacrifice. One of my biggest fears when, when I first got saved was that he was going to send me to Africa as a missionary. I, I was really fearful of that. I did not want to go to Africa or anywhere. I didn't want to be a missionary. I still don't have a heart to be a missionary. I have a heart to be a pastor teacher. That's my heart. Uh, I struggled with that at time to time because this church ha- has really not been geared towards being a missionary type of church. And I know there are a lot of churches that are geared that way. But that's not the way that I'm geared. And I was really comforted recently in a meeting. And um, I'm not going to say who it is. But he had the same heart. Uh, and he has a big church there in Chino. And he, he, he basically had the same heart. Like, I didn't really have a heart for missions either. I didn't want to go out to missions. I didn't like going out. I just like pastoring teaching. And I'm like, wow, Lord, thank you that you comforted my heart. Because I was feeling guilty about it all. But God doesn't do that, does he? We know that we're not deprived of pleasures or making sacrifices, right? No, we're willing to be deprived. We're willing to sacrifice because Christianity is a faith in Christ that deprives us of certain liberties that the world gets to participate in. Let's just be honest. It's difficult. It's hard. Yes, we have to be truthful. And yes, it's a sacrifice, Are you kidding me? To tithe? That's a big sacrifice for people. People hold on to their money like this. You know, they don't want to give it up. It's a sacrifice. God doesn't ask us to do anything that we're not willing to do. See, he was willing to sacrifice his life for us. He prayed there in the garden. He said, Lord, I am really troubled. I'm sweating drops of blood here, Lord. I don't want to do this, but not my will. Your will be done. He understood the sacrifice, the pain, the struggle of it all, just as we do with things that we're struggling with and, with the Lord and sacrificing and giving up to him. We can be uh, truthful with him about it. This is troubling, Lord. This is difficult, Lord, but not my will be done. Your will be done, Lord. I love you enough that I'm going to sacrifice that for you, God. Because you sacrificed your life for me so that I could have eternal life. People don't like to hear that. They don't understand it. Uh, My brother has basically disowned us because of our faith in Jesus Christ. They don't want to have anything to do with us. I reach out once in a while and I'll give him a call and just let him know that I'm here. And it's usually cordial. You know, hey, we'll get together. And I don't hear anything from him anymore. And I understand that because that's the way the world is. You know, it's kind of like a marriage. You know, you're single, and you go from being single where where you have total control of your life. You can go where you want. You cannot go where you don't want. You can spend what you want and not spend what you want. And all of a sudden, you fall in love, and you get married. And now that changes everything, right? The whole dynamics changes. You can't just go wherever you want. You can't just spend on, on what you want. Uh, there's another person involved that you have to consider, that you have to express love and be concerned over. And that's a sacrifice you make in marriage, right? Because you love this person and you want to be with this person and you want to be one with this person and so you sacrifice your own liberties, your own selfishness, your, your own desires and so forth. Now, marriage is very difficult, isn't it? I, I think all marriages are difficult. I don't know too many that aren't. They don't go through their struggles. And I think that's normal, by the way. Don't think that um, you're the only one going through it. No. See, there's three things about marriage that we need to understand. There's always the engagement ring. And then there's the wedding ring. But then there's the suffering that comes along with it. (laughs) Now, that's funny. I didn't put any gender to that, by the way. So you could take it either way. But it's true. Is it not true? Is it not true? There's the engagement we in the wedding ring, and then comes the suffering. Of course we're going to suffer. It's a wedding. You have two individuals that, that are 
you know, totally bipolar with <laughs> one another, and you're trying to bring them together. Take two magnets, they're bipolar. Boom, they're always bouncing off each other. Yeah, you have your good times and bad times, but it's love. It's sacrifice. It's work. And it's what we do when we know Jesus Christ. We work and we sacrifice and we love. We're not offended by him or where he asks of us. Or really you ask of us. If you were offended by the Super Bowl comments, you know, then, then I have to say, check your heart. Check your heart. If you're offended by what the word of God says, then you check your heart. My responsibility is to share the word of God. What do you give up when you're in love? <laughs> you give up a lot when you're in love. <clears throat> I was witnessing at the Riverside bus station here years ago, witnessing to this young man who actually had a pimp. Uh, he was pimping himself out um, whether to females or males, I, I don't know. I didn't get the chance to ask him. We were sharing Jesus with him. Uh, he was tired. Uh, he was being abused by his pimp. And so we offered him an alternative. We've offered him Jesus. He wasn't offended by it. He was intrigued. He saw the love. He saw the compassion that we had to take the time to talk with him, to even go down there and, and spend that Friday night, our Friday night, to go out and share with people. And he saw that. Well, as we were, we were talking with him, all of a sudden a, a car pulled up and this guy stands out and says, hey, get over here, let's go. And the guy, you could see he was torn. He was like, I gotta go. And we're like, no, you don't have to go. And the other guys would say, you need to stop talking to him. You need to leave him alone. And you could see him torn between the two. Yeah. He ended up going and we just prayed for him as he left. I don't know what happened to him, God knows. But he wasn't offended he was intrigued, and I think that it was a seed planted. You know, if he would have given his life to, to Jesus, he wouldn't have been deprived of anything. He actually would have been deprived of disease, of suffering, of pain. He wouldn't have to sacrifice his body. He would just sacrifice his life for Jesus, who would then replace it with peace and joy and great things. You see, it, it all depends on where you're at in the spectrum of life. If you're a wealthy man, then yeah, it can look like a sacrifice, but there are a lot of troubles that come with wealthiness. Believe me, I'm glad I'm not wealthy. Do you know the in and out has a new founder, right? It's the daughter of the founder of in and out Christian woman. But she lived her whole life in hiding, in hiding. You know why? Because she had kidnap attempts repeatedly on her life you're talking about a billionaire and so she never came out and never could live a normal life normal life but she loved jesus and now she runs the company with a lot of bodyguards around so with a lot of money comes a different types of troubles and struggles but christ doesn't ask us to do anything that we can't sacrifice that he hasn't sacrificed himself at all Herod was troubled and he didn't like the sacrifice. Look at verse four. When he had gathered or called all the chief priest scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ or the Messiah was to be born. And so he was basically asking the leadership at that time, possibly the Sanhedrin. Some suggest not the Sanhedrin. These were probably men that he had in his pocket, men in the community. Uh, this was a, a well-paid profession. At that time, these were religious leaders, scribes, and, 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 and chief priests and so forth that were manipulating the people with, with sacrifices and offerings, suggesting that theirs were not good enough. They had to sell them or get rid of them. They would take them, and then they would resell other ones to them and so forth. So they're manipulating the whole system. Herod had them in his pocket. And he goes to them and says, you guys are religious men. You know the scriptures. I want you to tell me from the scriptures uh, where this Jesus is to be born. If anyone knew, they should have known where this newborn king would be born. Now, whether they were fearful of, of, of him or what, we don't know. Um, it does make some sense because we know that uh, earlier, through Josephus the historian, he had uh, began his reign by massacring the Sanhedrins. He literally wiped them out, almost killed them all off. But that was 30 years ago, and you know who knows, Herod might have changed, and so he's desperate now, and now he wants to know exactly where the Messiah is to be born. And of course, the, the religious leaders probably went out, and they uh, 
were either searching or they knew right away where, where he was. Now, you would have think King Herod should have known he was a Jew, but he didn't know anything about the Bible, didn't know anything about the prophecy. He was living a life, you know, as it's coming, I'm going to live it and pretty much it. Let me ask you this, like King Herod who had to ask someone else, well, what does the scripture say about this Messiah? Where is he going to be born? Are you always asking someone else about the scriptures? Are you always asking questions? Now, not that that's wrong. I'm using the word always, highlight that. Are you always doing it? Or are you actually reading your Bible? Read your Bible. It's right there in front of us. Pick it up and just read it. Uh, we have devices. You can, you, you can get a device and you can go through a daily devotional through your Bible. You can go through the Bible in so many months or, or years and so forth. Get into the Word. Some of the guys here will put it down in an iPod and MP3 and they'll just listen to it as, as they're working or on their way to work and on their way back to work. Get into the Word of God. Don't depend on what someone else says. Oftentimes the questions come to me is like, so-and-so said this, is that true? Like, well, God, go to the Word. What does it say? You know, read, read the Bible. You can know for yourself. That's what I did. That's what a lot of people do, is they read for themselves. Now, I, I know that sometimes it's, it's difficult to read. I've, I've had people say that. Well, it's hard for me to read the Bible. It's very difficult for me to understand it. You know why that is? I think one of the reasons is because we want to know it all right now. We're kind of like that fast food thing. Give it to me all now so I can get to understand. No, it doesn't work like that. See, God, God purposely only gives us enough. Just like eating. You go to a smorgasbord and, and you look at everything. What do you want to do? I want to eat everything. You know, it's like everything looks good. Just put it on your plates. But you can't do that, right? So you can only eat a little bit at a time. And so you pick out a few things that, that you kind of like and you, you eat that. And then if there's room, you go and you get, you get some more or you find something else that's different. Well, spiritually, God knows what you need. He gives you just enough. And so as you're reading, just take what he gives you. Understand whatever it is that he's helping you to understand and keep going through. And then when you come back, believe me, 20, almost 30 years now, I'm still learning things. There are phrases, there are words that, that, that I didn't see before. Thoughts just in time, experience that all of a sudden makes the word come alive that much more. Are you reading your Bible or are you depending on someone else? Now, I'm not saying that there's no need for a pastor because God's called pastors to teach and to lead and elders and assistants to guide the people. There are those times where, you, where you've read and you are studying, but then you're, okay, I need just some prayer here because there are those gray areas. And so you go to leadership and you say, what does God say about this? This is what I have been getting. Well, you're right on. Go for it. It's just a little confirmation, a little help. It's, it's good to have a multitude of counselors, the Bible says. There's nothing wrong with that. So finding that balance. King Herod was a Jew, but he didn't know anything about the Bible. It seemed that Herod's wi uh, uh, Gentile wise men knew more about prophecy than Herod himself. Look at verse 5. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophets. So again, they, they come right back to him. He, he, he's, it's written by the prophets, that Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. It is written. You know, the world wants knowledge, but they don't want absolutes. You ever notice that? The world loves knowledge. Google. Google it. You know, the kids have Google available. They can look up anything. And then they'll come to you and say, you don't know what you're talking about. Because I Googled it. And Google says this. It's all there. It's all available to them a lot of knowledge but no absolute truth no way to understand how do i use that truth and how does it apply to our lives it's interesting because josh mcdowell said that he said parents have a very difficult job right now because young people know how to get on google young people know the computer they know how to work it and parents don't and so they will google things they will have questions and they'll google it and then they will go to the parents and they'll, they'll think of the parents as not knowing anything because they don't have the information that they have. Because parents either are not smart enough or they don't have the time to go to Google and Google it. And that's unfortunate. And I really think that parents need to sit their kids down and spend some time with them on what is right and what is wrong. Simple things like that. 
Yeah, you have a lot of knowledge available to you, but using it properly is very important. Let me give you some knowledge that you don't have. The Bible says, honor your father and mother, and you live long. And so if you take your knowledge, as the Bible says, and it puffs you up, that you think you know more, or you have more experience, then you're an heir. That's sin to you. And so be careful that the knowledge doesn't puff you up. There's a balance to that knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. Knowledge is great, but not when it's without absolutes and truth. Are you looking for truth or just information? As believers, we we sometimes do that. Give me information. I just want information. Information is good. It's good when we begin to apply the word of God, right? For it is written, it says there. Go to God's word. It is written. It, It will give us the instructions that we need. Matthew continues, verse six, but you, Bethlehem, In the land of Judea are not the least among the rulers of Judea. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So as these scribes and chief priests were answering Herod, they said, out of Bethlehem, which not a very big place, it's the least of of all the rulers there in Judea. They're in the land of Zebulon during the time of the patriarchs. Uh, Not much is known about uh, Bethlehem, just that it's little and small. In fact, some question uh, whether the Messiah could come out of Bethlehem. Now, Matthew did not finish, though, the prophecy here. The scribes didn't give him the whole thing. Because if you read Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and that's where they're quoting from in the Old Testament concerning the birth of the Messiah, it also says, whose going forth is from everlasting. Micah goes on to speak about his sitting upon the throne and reigning as the Messiah. Matthew did not quote 5 too directly, but he paraphrased it because he had a point. He wanted to bring out of the passage something important. And so he didn't quote the whole thing there. Bethlehem was the birthplace. Micah was the only prophet to specify that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. The least of the places, and that was Matthew's point. The least of the places, very small, that Jesus would come from the least. Jesus made a statement to the disciples. I did not come to be served, but to serve. The least. He also made another statement, and one that we should really memorize and probably adhered to a little more. He says, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, then be a servant to all. That's greatness, is being a servant. You want to be known in the kingdom of God? You want to be asked to sit up in the front where you can see Jesus a little closer? Be the servant of all. The ones that automatically sit at the front because they think they're servants, The ones that Jesus will say, hey, you, can you move? Because I got someone that's sitting in your spot. Can you move back a couple? See, if you want to be great, then be the servant of all. Bethlehem means a house of bread. Jesus was the bread of life. It was an insignificant little town among thousands there in Judah, five miles from Jerusalem. Not much. Bethlehem was was the burial place of Rachel, Rachel the wife of Jacob, not Leah, but but Rachel, whom Jacob loved dearly. It it has some history. The original home of Naomi and her family, it was a setting for much of the book of Ruth there in Bethlehem, where Ruth and Boaz met. Bethlehem was also the ancestral home of King David, and it was the fortified place of King Rehoboam. These men of Herod only had head knowledge, though, of the Messiah, but no heart knowledge. Oh, they could tell King Herod exactly where the Messiah would be born, according to the scriptures. They understood the scriptures. They understood them well, but they had it far from their hearts. That was the struggle. Here, these Gentile wise men were bringing gifts and, and coming to worship. Why weren't the scribes and chief priests saying, he's going to be in Bethlehem, the sign of the star. We're also going to come and worship. It was Herod that, that falsely said, I want to worship him. 
But in reality, it was the wise men that came to worship him. Where were they at? Where were these religious people? And that's how religion is. They really don't want to worship. They just want to direct and guide and lead. Mark said this of these religious leaders. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. Now, Isaiah prophesied that these scribes and chief priests would exist. Uh, they would be hypocrites. They would, they would say one thing and do another. They would wear masks. They would say they love God, but they really don't love God. They say they worship God, but they really don't want to worship God. This is what Jesus said, as it is written, the people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Now, I remember reading that scripture years ago in, in my daily reading of the scriptures. And, and every time I come across that scripture, I always ask myself, are you just honoring him with your lips or with your heart? Because there are times when when it just comes out of the mouth, but the heart isn't there. You know, you're in pain and you're suffering, you're wondering why. And you're asking God to help, but in reality, you're, you're just saying, heal me so I can go on with my life. But there's no worship, there's no acknowledgement that you're in control. There's those times. I want a heart that worships God, that loves God, that's connected to God. James says, you believe in God, or you believe there's one God that's good. Even the demons, even they believe, but they fear and they tremble because they don't have a connection to the Lord. They know that their place will be in outer darkness in the pit. Oh, they have knowledge of him. They know who he is. These demons even saw the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the heavens, but they chose not to worship him. When you go to Titus, Paul talks about Cretans, and how they claim to know Titus 1, 12 through 16, how they claim to know God. This is interesting. This is one of those, those, those scriptures and all of a sudden it just pops out at you. And he's talking about these Cretan, these men, these gluttons, and, and people see them and yet they reject the truth and so forth. But it says they claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. Our actions can deny our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says right here. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for doing anything good. Your actions. What are my actions? How am I worshiping the Lord? All God wants, all God wanted to do was to give himself as a shepherd to the people. That's it. I just want to be your shepherd. I want to be your Messiah. I want to prepare the way that you enter into eternal life. Look at the last statement there in verse, verse six. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people. The pastoral role of God Almighty, Jehovah God and the Messiah was to rule over their people. That's his desire. Even today, it hasn't changed to rule over you. Just to rule over you. He wants to be your God. I can't be your God. And from time to time, I, I hear it from people. Well, he failed me. Yeah, I'm going to fail you. Well, he said this. Yeah, I'm going to say the wrong thing. God doesn't say the wrong thing and God will never fail you. He might not give you what you want because he has better plans for you, but he is your God. He is your Savior. <sighs> Hebrews 13, 20, Jesus is called the great shepherd of the sheep. He's the great shepherd. I'm not. Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. I'm not. Peter calls Christ the chief shepherd. He's the chief. He's among the rest as the best. And us pastors down here on earth are not. The lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall be their shepherd in Revelation 17 says. Even in heaven, the lamb of God will be in the throne and the, he will be in the midst of all those. He will be their shepherd. Revelation tells us that God will be our light. We won't need a son I woke up this morning and I was listening to a message that, that basically said that. I think it was uh, Randall who was talking about that in heaven. Can you imagine? That? I was looking at the light and how the sun rising, I can't see the sun anywhere, but there's light everywhere. You ever notice that? 
but you don't see where the sun is. You know it's, it has risen because just through, through experience, we know that. But there's light everywhere, and I'm thinking, wow, Jesus is going to be so bright that there'll be light everywhere. And he won't be so bright that I cannot approach him. Pretty awesome when you think about it. He will be our shepherd. Jesus told Peter to shepherd the lambs. Now here's Jesus, the great shepherd, good shepherd, in the midst of the throne being worshipped as a shepherd, and he's telling Peter, now shepherd my sheep. And that's my responsibility. Our word pastor means shepherd. That's all the word means. I'm a shepherd. Roman's a shepherd. Fausto's a shepherd. And blessings come when we humble ourselves before the Lord. Fausto and, and his wife, Pat, <clears throat> had the privilege of going with Laura and her husband, Francisco, to the hospital because of little baby Or... Oh, I can't say that word. Orsway? Orsway. <laughs> okay, it's in Spanish. Joshua. But they, they went to pray for little Joshua. And even at that age, God is using this little child. And they've seen several people next door in other rooms that needed prayer and come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what happens when you become a shepherd. God gives you those opportunities. But you have to be willing to go out there and do that. And they were willing to go out there and take their life and their time and sacrifice it to the Lord. Look at verse 7. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined... for from them what time, the exact time the star appeared. Uh, <clears throat> Barclay says, uh, for a private interview, is what Herod wanted. This private meeting was about destroying, uh, really, Jesus, killing him, to be quite frank with you. Uh, but he didn't let that motive known to the religious leaders. You know, the enemy wants to destroy you. Look at, look at sneaky Herod here, look at, just drop down to verse 16 real quick. And Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi's. He was furious. And he, he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi's. They told him the time and so they took off because they knew really what was going on here. And he became furious. He said, you know, wipe them all out, kill them all. From, from infant to two years old, because he wasn't sure how long it's been since the birth of Christ. So anywhere from a baby to two years have gone by while these magis were looking for him. And Herod says, go out there and kill them. Not only in Bethlehem, but the surrounding areas. I want them all dead. That's how furious he was. The enemy's like that. He wants to destroy us. Don't fall into his lies. It can be very sneaky. Very subtle, easy temptations. You might enjoy them, but it only pulls you away from the Lord. Or it could be outright deliberate, very, very um, drastic, and you know that he's involved in it. Just keep the balance. Keep what is supposed to be centered in your life, Christ, and you know that the enemy can't get in there. Peter says, uh, be in self-controlled. And be alert. That's all we need to do. Be alert and self-controlled with ourselves. Because we have an enemy, the devil, prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's his job. That's his motive is to destroy and to kill. So you, you don't want to get involved with that. You just want to stay focused. Keep Christ the center of your life and you're good. You'll keep going forward. God will bless you for that. Don't stray to the right or to the left. Just stay on path with what the Lord is doing. So Herod then asks these wise men, look at verse 8, he sent uh, to them, or he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully or accurately uh, for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him alone. So he, he looks at these religious Chaldeans who brought gifts and so forth to Jesus, it says, so you found him. Go back there and, and tell me exactly where he's at so that I can come down right after and, and, and worship him too. You can almost see the politician's face, you know, very sincere, knows the moves. Oh, wow, wonderful. 
great, I'd love to worship him, you know, all those right moves, you know, and in reality, he's like, yeah, I'd love to worship him, kill him with a sword, you know, type of thing. He didn't want to worship him at all. He was very cunning, very bloody. Uh, Wilson's translation says, pay him reverence. If it were not for God, Herod would have killed Jesus. Think about that for a second. If it were not for God, Herod would have killed Jesus. If it were not for God, Herod would kill you, or the enemy would kill you. He would destroy you. The only reason that you're here is because God's grace and his mercies. If it weren't for God, many would have already destroyed this ministry. Many. There have been people who have left, you're not going to survive. <laughs> God's going to curse it. Yeah. If it weren't for God, not because of me, but because God. God's gracious and merciful and he knows how to protect his people and he knows how to protect his word. And when I said this ministry, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the work that's here that God is doing. It has nothing to do with me. It has to do with Jesus. I was talking to Bob Probert at the um, celebration and um, we were just talking about old times and, and things in Israel when we went to Israel together and so forth. And, and he started talking, wow, 20 years. He says, wow, what God can do if you just let him have it. I go, yeah, that's, that's all I try to do is just let him have it. Uh, I don't want it to be my hands. He goes, yeah, you, don't, you wouldn't believe how many people want their hands and what the Lord is doing. He goes, hey, it's, it's happening at my church. It happens at every church. Just let God do what he wants to do with the church and let the church be the church. Stop trying to guide and lead the church. It's God's church. It's not my church. Now I have a responsibility to the church. You have a responsibility and we all have responsibilities. And if we just be the church, the church would flourish like a flower. God intervened to protect his son from the jealous rage of Herod. Now this is false worship, isn't it? On Herod's part. Look at it. Herod's false worship, pride, did not want him to give up his throne, anger, greed, envy, not wanting to give up his riches. That's the whole reason, too much to sacrifice. He's one of, one, he is one who disrupts God's plans, not one that goes along with his plans. They could only expect the worst from King Herod. You know, he murdered his wife, Miriam, and her mother, Alexandria, because he was suspicious. Josephus tells us that Herod killed three of his own sons. He had murdered two of his sons in 4 BC. Shortly before his, his own death, he executed another son. He executed officials, scribes, and religious people also because of suspicion. They used to say it's safer to be Herod's pig than it is to be his son. Herod was an Edomite. He was in the line of the kings. He was under Rome control. But he got control of Judea there shortly before Christ. Herod the Great ruled from 37 to 3 BC, just after the birth of Christ. So shortly after he had killed all the babies, he had died. Got his throne and he kept it by crimes of unspeakable brutality and murder. He thought of his sons and his wife uh, were plotting against him, so again he had them killed. When he began to miss his wife Miriam, he built this big monument to her. You can see that the guy was almost demonic in a sense, and some suggest that he was probably demon-possessed to do these things. He realized at one of the points where he was saying that nobody would mourn him, so he had planned that at his death that his men would kill a bunch of leaders so that there would be mourning within the, the land. And of course, they were smart enough not to follow through with that. <clears throat> his son, Herod Atiapis, some 33 years later, killed John the Baptist and mocked Christ. His grandson, Herod Agrippa I, 14 years still later, killed James the Apostle. 
in Acts chapter 12. His great-grandson, Herod Agrippa II, 16 still years later, was the king before Paul, who was tried. So this whole family came from a corrupt line and did not know how to worship the Lord. If you were to travel, travel to Europe, you'll find some old cathedrals there. Uh, many, many of them there that, that are all over the place. They're in France, and they're very beautiful on the inside. You, you walk in, you just go, wow, magnificent. It really brings uh, the atmosphere of God and so forth. Very beautiful. But when you look at the outside, it's very distasteful. There's art carvings which depict animals and hideous figures on the outside. Now, why is that? It's said that the builders in the Middle Ages wanted these figures to represent man's carnal appetites and prejudices. That they were to be reminded that we are all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. That we all have prejudices and hideous animals hidden away. And that we need to leave that stuff outside when we come to worship the Lord. We need to confess those things before God. Before we come to the altar and we offer up our tithes or our offerings and gifts unto the Lord. It's a good reminder for us. There were 24 elders in Revelation chapter 4 verse 10 and they fell down before him who sat on the throne and they worshipped him and lived forever and ever casting their crowns before him picture that forever and ever Jesus on the throne and 24 elders casting their thrones crowns before him and worship him ever and ever this is in heaven this is what we'll be doing probably for the first trillion years worshiping the Lord we should get used to it now to so worship the Lord with our hearts. What do you think we're going to be doing? Worshiping the Lord. You know, you might have the appearance of worship, might practice the three positions that we talked about earlier, bowing down, kneeling down, uh, with our face to the ground and so forth, but worship without truth and spirit is dead, Jesus said, John chapter 4. Because those who worship me in truth and spirit, those are my children. Those are my children. We're carnal. We're prejudiced. We're human beings. But if we confess our sins before coming into his presence to worship and leave bitterness and wrath outside the sanctuary of God, we'll receive his blessings and his honor. I was just reading an article, and we're probably going to talk about this at the couples about honor. You know, if you say you honor God and you dishonor his people, you don't honor God. That's an interesting statement. You want to honor God? then honor him with the right heart. Honor him by loving others. Honor him by forgiving. Honor him by moving on and letting God be God and the church be the church. Let's make an effort to come to God with a pure heart. Say, here I am, Lord, with all my flaws and all. You know me. I'm not going to hide anything from you. And so I just come before you to worship you in truth and in spirit.